Welcome back to another edition of our diocesan podcast, Big City Catholics, with Bishop Robert Brennan, our diocesan bishop of Brooklyn, myself, Father Christopher Henyu. Today we've got a great topic in store, talking about the Eucharistic revival and our upcoming events here in the diocese, but we'll begin in prayer. Asking our Blessed Mother's intercession, we pray, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Bishop, we had a, a nice weekend. You joined us at the Great Irish Fair. And thanks for being a part of that. Oh, no, I was glad to do it. It's a beautiful celebration of Holy Mass in the Parish of Holy Name. They had about 12 honorees. Two of the honorees, I'm so proud, were two of our priests, Father Keating and Monsignor Delende. Also, one of the Mercy Sisters was honored. What really touched me was the presence of honorees who are making impacts in all different areas. So certainly members who were involved in the life of the church, people who are in business, in education, in legal professions, in the media, in the music industry. So we were recognizing the presence of Irish Americans in various sectors of society. And you said it at the festival about simply that, how each of these people represent a way in which the Irish have made a contribution to the society at large. And of course, you know, with a name like Brennan, and most people don't know that the name Henu also is an Irish name, we're maybe a little bit biased toward, but that's the beauty of all of those who have immigrated to this country. You said it during your homily. You said, my grandfather didn't come to this country to make a better life for himself. He came to make a better life for my parents and therefore, in return, a better life for me. And isn't that the truth about the whole context of immigration? And that's the story of Brooklyn through the ages, and Brooklyn and Queens through the ages. People have come here, and very often you have immigrant groups, but you have individual families who have come here, who've gotten their footing here, and then they move on to other parts of the country. I said it in a joking manner, but it was a true story. I was in Ireland back in November for the wedding. A fellow said, oh, I have a cousin who lives on Flatbush Avenue. Might you know them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you go outside the world, everybody knows something about Brooklyn or Queens. <laughs> yes, exactly. Don't you know everyone on Flatbush Avenue? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. These are stories, the hopes and the dreams of people who come to our country. Right now, we're seeing something that really could be described as a crisis with people who are coming here in such great numbers and in the midst of such bedlam. You hear now of the city saying that they're overwhelmed by it. And there are a lot of political aspects to this. I don't deny the political concerns at all. I think people have a right to law and order. I think there are some humanitarian questions that this bedlam isn't fair to the people who themselves are seeking asylum, that the human dignity of our people is being kept. I think that on both sides of the political aisle, there's a greater concern for political goods than for people in general. And, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing, but we have to really focus what the church has always proposed is comprehensive immigration reform, which respects the dignity of the human person, which seeks law and order, which is constantly building up society. But with respect for all of that, where we are in the church is we meet the needs of our neighbor. And we respond to the call of Jesus Christ. If somebody's hungry, we try to give them food. If someone's thirsty, we try to provide drink. And I have to say, I've been edified by the way that our parishes have been stepping up. Oh, for these last months, now we're going to more than a year and really trying to meet people where they are to provide for material needs, to provide for spiritual needs. And they've been terrific. Catholic Charities has been out in front of the issue. Again, helping people really just to try to unravel all the mixed results they get too. They're getting all kinds of contradictory information from the system, from the, the system itself. We're doing the best that we can to meet people. But again, it's always got to be rooted in human dignity. We hope that every church is a place of refuge for all those in need. As Pope Francis would say, it's, it's the field hospital where we can seek refuge, where we can seek healing and support. I'll say, you know, 
that when I travel different countries, you feel a sense of comfort when you see a Catholic church. I do that. You say, this is a place where I know that I'll find home if I'm in need. And many of our recently arrived asylum seekers do come and knock on the church's doors. And well, you know, in the beginning of the reality we're facing right now, that's exactly what people were doing. People were coming to the church because they were looking for churches. There were people who showed up in our parishes because they were looking for that spiritual nourishment. Of course, they were also hungry. And of course, sure. the pastors were able to help. I remember meeting a couple at the co-cathedral. I think it was New Year's Day. And they were really there for mass. But the need was quite evident. We do the both and. And at the same time, we call out for human dignity for a system that works, that doesn't overwhelm. A nation has a right to secure the borders, but at the same time, we've always been a nation that's welcomed people. And I think you can have both realities, sure. but it involves getting past the political tensions. And we as Catholics, faithful citizens of our city, of our counties, of our country, of course, have the right to petition our political leaders, those who are in elected office, to do remember to treat these recently arrived with human dignity, with respect, and in a way that, that helps to provide both protection and a healthy response. So uh, that kind of plays into who we are as the church. We talk about diversity among our members, and as we're getting closer now to our Eucharistic revival, we're celebrating that diversity. We are a church of many, many nations. We are a church of people who pray in different languages, but come together. I've recently been using a prayer from the old Missal. It comes from the Mass for Christian unity. There's a version of this in the Missal, but just the wording, it's so perfect. How wonderful are the works of the Spirit revealed in so many gifts, yet how marvelous is the unity the Spirit creates from their diversity as He dwells in the hearts of your children, filling the whole church with His presence and guiding it with His wisdom. One of our great realities in the Diocese of Brooklyn and Queens, which is the reality of the universal church, is that we see such a diversity, a diversity of peoples, but really also a diversity of gifts, people who have different gifts and talents, which they give to the life of the church. But where the spirit is at work is bringing about unity within that diversity, that we come together as one family to praise God. We come together as one family and are united by the same gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is rooted in the truth. And we come together to the one sacrament of the Eucharist and, and each of the sacraments. We're united by one faith, one baptism. We're united in the celebration of the Eucharist and in all the gifts that the Lord gives to us. It's true. And I think in preparation for our upcoming Eucharistic revival, which is taking place Saturday, October 7th, at Maimonides Park, where the Cyclones play in Coney Island. Now, quite remarkable news just come out that we've basically almost sold out all the tickets. We, as of midweek, we were at uh, 6,200 people. <laughs> That's um, it's a wonderful thing. Now, again, we need you all to pray. Pray for good weather. We really need that good weather. And so we're looking forward to being together. You know, when we go to Washington, D.C., when we have our pilgrimage every two or three years in Washington, D.C., we have about 3,000 people, and that's really quite respectable. So when you think about it, wow, 6,200, we've doubled it. And as you say, you know, to bring 6,000 people together in our diocese, which is clearly going to be a reflection of the mosaic that is our diocese in, our, in different cultures, different languages, how are you prepping for that in terms of the liturgy? Is this a topic of, that you plan to preach on? Yes. Well, first of all, it's going to be something that's a lived experience. So certainly the multicultural aspect should come out in the music and throughout the whole day. But yes, there's a sense of that unity and diversity. But the unity is in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So if we're going to talk about the Eucharist. You know, Where is this all coming from? The Eucharistic revival is a matter of our response to the crisis of faith, people's response to the real presence of Jesus, whether it be a matter of faith, belief, or a crisis of understanding, either way, it's about real presence. But I started asking myself this question at the Chrism Mass over and over again in Mulligan. That really goes back to our encounter with Jesus to begin with. Do we see Jesus as a real person? You know, there's the tendency to think of Jesus in terms of 
a really good person who lived a long time ago, whose work goes on as a great, maybe even an inspiring historical figure. But Jesus is risen. He intends to remain with us until the end of time. And he seeks for us to have a relationship with us. Jesus is not just a memory, but he's a living person who engages us in a relationship. And so really, how do you believe or how do you express a belief in the real presence of somebody who is only a memory? It's not going to work. So if we're going to have Eucharistic revival, it's going to start from our relationship with Jesus Christ and to his living presence in the church that he calls us together as the people of God, united in a universal way. How wonderful are the gifts of the Spirit revealed in so many gifts, yet how marvelous is the unity the Spirit creates from the diversity as he dwells in the hearts of your children, filling the church with his presence and guiding it with his wisdom. Beautiful. And we really do hope that's an aspect of this day that will live on in the diocese and in the hearts of those who attend. Right. So, so maybe one thing for all of us, myself, as I'm preparing what I may be talking about, but I invite everyone who's coming, or, and even those who aren't coming, but who are joining us in prayer that day, to reflect on that question in preparation. Where is my relationship with Jesus? Do I see Jesus as a real person in whom I can confide? as a real person who is deeply concerned about what I'm concerned about, who wants to share my burdens with me, and who wants to be involved in all the aspects of my life. So yes, that's the starting point for the coming Great, together. we're getting a little sneak peek of the future homily there. And then the other side of that is, well, what does this real presence of Jesus create? But he sends us out not only as missionaries, there's a missionary aspect, but he sends us out in communion with one another. We are united with each other to build up that body here in the church. And that's another aspect that we want to be able to work together on here in Brooklyn and Queens, our identity. We have great parochial identity, which is something to be very, very proud of, you know, but our shared identity as Catholic people our shared identity as people united in the faith, that we are, first of all, Catholics, and then members of our parish right. or organization or movement, that we are united by one faith, one baptism. That's right. There is a beauty to this. Many dioceses that, of course, they say historically, you didn't refer to where you were from by town, but more by the parish that you grew up in. And that is a beautiful aspect of our faith and being proud of to be a part of a particular parish. But really, as you say, Bishop, the bigger picture here is we are all Catholics. You know, not one parish is better than another. And when you look at it, I mean, all of our parishes, they're wonderful gifts. But as a diocese, one of the things we need to do is be able to respond to the needs of the broad spectrum of God's people. That's why we think of ourselves beyond our own limits and really as that church united in Christ. So Bishop, practically, you know, how do you see that lived out here in the diocese? How do you see an idea of universal Catholicism rather than parochial Catholicism? Well, you know, we've seen over the years, we were talking about this at the beginning of our conversation today, that great movement in our diocese, you know, all of a sudden you have a crowd of people, a very strong Catholic identity in one particular place. And then, you know, as the demographics change, you, you see some of that reflected, that change is reflected in the parishes. A parish might become older and uh, less populated by Christians, but then it's not that people disappear, but we have other parts in the diocese where people are bursting at the seams to fit into the church. And so the church has to be responsive to where people are. And we also need to be able to work together, you know. So for example, a parish might not be able to do all the works of a catechetical program. However, Two parishes might be able to do that. Sure. That's just an example, but there are ways that we work together. I'm not introducing anything new. That's been the story of Brooklyn and Queens, too, that parishes have been able to work together and to join in on projects together. The same is true with youth ministry, maybe some of our outreach. Sure. We see it, and I saw it in, in my own experiences in Richmond Hill, bringing together two parishes to work together, and not the identity of both churches, rather 
I said, we are the Catholics of Richmond Hill. Right. You know, instead of we're a holy child, Jesus parishioners or St. Benedict Joseph Labre parishioners, we're the Catholics of Richmond Hill. We're here to be brothers and sisters as Catholics in faith and bringing together processions and Eucharistic adorations and catechetical exactly. programs. It's a, it's a much stronger And, and celebrating each other's cultures. That's when right. We, when we are brought together, we have more things that we can celebrate. Amen. Well, I look forward to your expanding on this topic, certainly, Bishop. It's still a work in progress. It's still <laughs> a work in progress. That's a day. And then, of course, in the many months and years to come, as we continue this understanding, this revitalization of both the Eucharistic presence, but also our universal Catholic faith. Bishop, great to be with you again as we discuss what's going on in the diocese and share the upcoming events. Uh, if you'd like to end with a final prayer. Sure. And I ask you to continue to pray for good weather on October 7th. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and grant you his peace. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for tuning in to another edition of our Dawson podcast, Big City Catholics. We hope to see you on October 7th at Coney Island, Maimonides Park, at our Eucharistic Revival. Until then, keep listening to our Dawson podcast and share it on all major platforms. God bless. Thank you.